This screencast is intended for teachers of fourth grade social studies to aid in the teaching of the Georgia Standards of Excellence. Because it is the foundation of our government, and all of American society operates within the framework of our government, an understanding of the U.S. Constitution should be the bedrock of our social studies teaching. Most of the issues and decisions our country faces in the centuries to follow its writing stem from the perspective of this guiding document. The foundations for the Constitution begin in the Declaration of Independence, as it was the very rights promised there that the Constitution seeks to protect. From there we will look at what the major leaders of the Constitutional Convention felt the purpose of government should be, and how it should be structured, and also take a look at some of the challenges they faced and compromises they had to make. Finally, we will take a look at the concerns many of the individual states had in regards to the stronger federal government laid out in the Constitution, and how their concerns were addressed through the Bill of Rights. It was all well and good to tell King George III of England, you are not the boss of me, and then to fight a war to prove it. But somebody had to be the boss of us. And some of your students may ask, why? Why does someone have to be the boss of us? Why do we have to have rules? And by extension, why do societies have to have governments? So just before teaching this unit may be a good time to do an activity or lesson that illustrates for them what a society would be like without rules, and how the likely result is that the strongest, or the bullies, get what they want, and the rest of us have to put up with it because we have no one to protect our rights. When the delegates at the Second Continental Congress wrote the Declaration of Independence, they gave a very clear reason why we felt the need to separate from British rule and become a nation of our own. They held the firm belief that all people have certain natural rights. By natural they meant that we are born with them, that they are inherent in our existence, and that it is not up to a government to choose whether we may have them or not. And they listed those rights as the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They also felt that government is created by people for the purpose of protecting those rights, and that the English government was no longer doing that for the colonists, and so they had the right to create a new government that does. Later in this screencast, we will see how these same beliefs become the core of how our new government was structured, and how the opening statement or preamble to the Constitution reiterates that. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, created our government, and it is only by our consent that it can exist in the first place. But we get ahead of ourselves. Recognizing the need for a new government to replace the one we were separating from, the next thing the Congress did after declaring independence was set up a committee to go about writing a document that did just that, and in November of 1777 they presented the Congress with the Articles of Confederation. Now Congress had recognized the need for a federal government to hold the individual states together, but the states balked at the idea. They were in the midst of fighting for their freedom from one tyrannical and abusive government, they weren't about to risk replacing it with another, and they were very concerned that if they gave a central government too much power, it would soon come to abuse that power. And so, the final ratified version of the Articles had a very watered-down and weak central government. The full name for the Articles was The Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union Between the States of, and then it lists the thirteen former colonies. And it really was just a loose confederation of individually sovereign states. The government was given fairly broad powers over foreign issues, and had the power to form an army, create alliances with other nations, and declare war, or peace. But it was given very little domestic control. It could print money, but not much else. Not surprisingly, they were not given the power to tax the people, or have any control over business or trade, or any real way to enforce any laws they might make. In debt from the war, the American government was unable to collect enough money to pay those debts, greatly weakening her position economically. Issues of trade with Great Britain soon emerged, and each state handled it differently, causing much trouble and strife. James Madison and George Washington recognized the growing problem and asked the delegates to meet again to discuss how to fix the problems. They agreed, and in May of 1787 they met in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania at the Constitutional Convention and chose George Washington to preside over the meeting because of the immense respect and trust he had gained during the war. Madison had been studying successful governments around the world and determined that we needed a blend of national and federal systems of government where power would be separated but shared between the federal and state governments. 
In such a system the federal government, or central government, is given the greater power it needs, but that power is divided among smaller units or branches, creating a system of checks and balances that would prevent it from being able to become abusive, and states still retain the right to govern themselves in many areas. His plan, which became known as the Virginia Plan, with its three distinct branches of government, would form the foundation upon which the Constitution was built. And so Madison has been often called the father of the Constitution. Under Madison's plan, the federal government would be a republic made up of three separate branches with separate powers and the ability to check or balance each of the other two. The legislative branch would have the authority to write the laws and the power to declare war or peace. This would serve as a check to the presidential role as commander-in-chief of the armed forces, as that falls under the executive branch. They would also have the power, under a two-thirds majority, to overrule a presidential veto of their proposed laws. The executive branch was given the power to enforce the laws and so have control of the U.S. military. Additionally, the president may either accept the laws the legislative branch writes with his or her signature or reject them in the form of a veto. This gives the executive branch a check over the legislative. And finally, the judicial branch, or court system, is given the power to decide the law, or to determine whether a law complies to the mandates of the Constitution, whether it is constitutional or not, which gives them the power to toss out a law, thereby being a check to the other two branches. State, and even local governments, would be modeled in the same way. Each state has a House of Representatives and a Senate, for the legislative branch, a governor, police force, and national guard as its executive branch, and state court system for its judicial branch. Local governments have county and city commissions, police and mayors, and local courts. This portion of the plan went pretty much uncontested and so forms the basic structure of our government today. The rest of the plan did not go quite so smoothly. When the convention first met, Madison's Virginia Plan was presented and debate broke out immediately. Madison's original Virginia Plan featured two legislative houses responsible for creating the laws of the nation, and representatives for each would be based on population. Smaller states, such as Rhode Island, immediately objected on the basis of it giving larger states more power. In turn, the New Jersey plan was put forth that called for representation to be an even one per state. But large states felt that gave small states too much power as they proportionally represented fewer people. In the end, Roger Sherman, the delegate from Connecticut, came up with a plan called the Connecticut Compromise that determined in one house, the House of Representatives, delegates would be based on population, and in the other, the Senate, delegates would be two per state. This mollified both large and small states and became known as the Great Compromise. This, however, quickly ushered in another divisive issue. How to count the populations. States which relied heavily upon slavery, and so held a large number of slaves, claimed those slaves should be counted towards their number of representatives. The smaller New England states that held very few slaves saw this as giving the slaveholding states too much power because while slaves were a part of the population, they had no rights, and in southern states were considered property, and therefore why should they count toward representation? This would only serve to give the white owners more power, and encourage ownership of more slaves. So a compromise was reached that the slaves would count as three-fifths of a person toward representation, and so it was called the Three-Fifths Compromise. The final major issue with this new constitution was that the states were still very concerned that they were giving up too much of their individual power to a central government and that it would be abused. Once again, James Madison had a plan. The solution to this concern came in the form of the Bill of Rights drafted by Madison, which are in fact the first ten amendments or changes to the constitution. These amendments were designed to ensure that our government was indeed there to protect the individual liberties and rights of the people, and so clearly spelled out the limits of that government's power. We do not have time in this screencast for a thorough look at each of the rights enumerated in the Bill of Rights, but please take the time to look at them one by one with your students and discuss the rights they are designed to protect. Perhaps Benjamin Franklin summed it all up best in his closing remarks. In his own unique, backhanded, compliment sort of way, he essentially said that no government created by men could ever be perfect, because of all the wisdom many people bring to the endeavor, they also bring their imperfections. 
but the Constitution they had created was about as close as it comes to that perfection. Before we go, it is important to understand that our Constitution created a democratic republic and not a direct democracy. In a democratic republic, the true power lies with the people, however they do not directly vote on every single issue that comes up, as that would be ridiculously impractical. Instead, they vote directly on some issues, but otherwise they elect officials who are entrusted to represent them and vote according to how the majority of their constituents wish. And if they do not do so, the people have the power to vote them out. That is all we have time for today. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Here you will find some links to some helpful resources, as well as the works used in the creation of this screencast.